welcome to worship, from our home to yours. As we begin, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, just take a moment to offer a virtual greeting in the comments. Also, please share this video on your wall, or maybe even host a watch party, so that others can join us in worship this morning. There is no bulletin this morning, but you may go to our website where you can download this weekly newsletter for the latest on what's happening this week. We'd also invite you to bring up the Bible app on your phone and to locate the event for this morning. You can use the app to follow along and take notes during the sermon. I've been asked to share scripture, so this morning I want us to turn together to Micah chapter 6. And we're going to read verses 6 through 8. As we've been in the midst of this pandemic stuff, what's come to light for me over and over again is what's really important when it comes to worship. How should we be? Or just living in general, even. What's important? And uh, pomp and circumstance, flash and all kinds of mirrors and smoke and all kinds of stuff. The things that we normally see in worship sometimes, maybe not necessarily at Pigeon River, but, you know, in other places. Maybe those things aren't so important. But what is important? And the thing that I keep coming back to is the condition of the heart. And that's what Micah is talking to us about here in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And he says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the simplicity of your love. We thank you for the, the uh, joy that you give us and the simple offering of your entire life for our souls. May we think this day about how you have done this for us. May it influence our worship. And may you take this hour and make it hallowed by your presence. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Now let us join together in song as Laura leads us in singing, Lord, I need you. Would you please join us for worship this morning?
Good morning. Today I'll be reading Exodus 16, 2 through 3, then 9 through 21, and then 31 through 36. Exodus 16, 2. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, At twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed. And when the sun grew hot, it melted away. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made of honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for generations to come so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets of the covenant law so that it might be preserved. The Israelites ate manna 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. And Omer is one-tenth of an ephah. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Lord, as we gather together this morning, we invite your presence in this space. As we consider these teachings that you offered to the disciples on how they should pray, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and minds to receive this truth, that it may go deeply into our spirits and provide a transforming reality for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 2004, I was serving as the Minister of Youth and Christian Education at Grace Mennonite Church in Pandora, Ohio. Part of that role was to lead the Sunday evening youth gatherings that happen, and also to lead the Wednesday evening children's club program that we had at Grace, a ministry that Leslie Eberly actually had a part of as well as she led the children's choir for a season there at Grace. 
Another aspect of my responsibility was to plan the summer youth trip that would take place each year. In the odd-numbered years, we would typically attend the Mennonite Church Youth Convention that took place. And then in the even-numbered years, we would plan a mission or a service trip. In the summer of 2004, we opted to go with MCC, Mennonite Central Committee, and in particular, their service through SWAP, serving with Appalachian people. Now, Grace Mennonite is much like Pigeon River in that it was situated in a small town, rural environment. And so in choosing our summer mission trip, one might expect us to opt for an urban environment to go to in order to include a cross-cultural element to our service experience as well. And yet, as we went down to the hollers of eastern rural Kentucky, as we interacted with the people there, we had a very profound and transformational experience. We went there knowing that the people did not have much. They didn't have much and they didn't have ways in order to provide for their needs. And so we went to take with us what we had to offer to them. And yet, as we got to know the people, we received much more than what we expected in that time. I'll come back to that in a moment. But first, let's consider where we are in the midst of this sermon series that we've begun on the Lord's Prayer. Two weeks ago, we were reflecting upon Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Last week, we followed up with Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If this is your first time joining us this morning, or if you missed one of those previous services, they're still available on our YouTube channel or on our Facebook page, and we'd invite you to go back and to experience those as well to catch up with what we've been talking about. But all of that brings us this morning to give us this day our daily bread. Bread. Let's take a moment to consider the significance of bread in our lives. Bread is something that comes in so many different varieties, and it is a part of just about every meal that we eat together in one way or another. Not to mention all the different varieties of breads that are available throughout the various countries and cultures of the world. For us in America, we may oftentimes take bread for granted because it's so readily available, at least that is until we come to circumstances like we live in in these days, in which we may go to the local grocery store and find that the bread aisle is completely barren and empty. That experience may help us to be more aware of the significance that bread has in our lives. How integral it is to our meals. It may also help us to better identify with so many around the world that struggle on a daily basis to put bread on the table for their family. But beyond the realities of bread in our current context, think with me for a moment about the significance of bread throughout Scripture. Probably most profoundly we see this within the Old Testament passage that we have for this morning, in which it refers to the manna that was provided in the wilderness. But think for a moment how the Israelites came to that place of need at all. I mean, in order for them to end up in the wilderness, they first had to go to Egypt. And what was it that led them to Egypt? Well, it was the need of bread, the need of food, of provision. There was a famine in the land. Jacob and his family didn't have the food that they needed to survive. And they heard that over in Egypt, there were stockpiles of grain, food that was plentiful. And so they went to Egypt to get food. They spent time there, they settled down there, and eventually they become slaves of the people of Egypt, which led to their need for the Exodus to escape, for them to go into the wilderness and to head towards the promised land. We'll come back to that in a moment, but first let's also consider the significance of bread within the New Testament. When Jesus began his ministry, We read that he went out into the wilderness for 40 days and fasted. And that towards the end of those 40 days, the devil came and tempted him. One of those temptations being to take the stones that were before him and to transform them into loaves of bread. But Jesus responded that man cannot live on bread alone, 
but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then we also read in his Sermon on the Mount of these instructions that he gives to his disciples to pray for their daily bread, to pray for God's provision. Those are just a few examples within Scripture that talk about bread, just to get us thinking about them. Perhaps you have others that come to your mind. If so, feel free to take a moment to name those in the comments below and to share them with others. But within these realities, these stories of the Old and New Testament, it seems clear to me that in these instructions from Jesus about how we should pray, that we should pray that God would give us our daily bread, that he's calling us to pray for at least two things, and within that, to receive a much greater reality. In the first place, it seems to me that God is inviting us, that Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray for God to provide their physical sustenance. I mean, I think that's what we see in our story this morning from Exodus chapter 16. The Israelites have escaped from Egypt. They've crossed through the Red Sea. God has been providing water for them, and yet they still need bread. They need something to eat. And as they cry out to God for that, God answers their prayer. He answers their cries. He provides for them manna, bread from heaven. Each day they are to go out and they'll find scattered on the ground this manna. They'll collect what they need for that day, but nothing more. If they get greedy and take more than they need for that day, or if they lack faith to trust that God will provide more for the next day, that which they take that's beyond their needs will spoil in the night. In this, God is providing for their physical needs. At the same time, teaching them to trust in Him on a daily basis to provide for those needs. I have to imagine that as Jesus instructed his disciples to pray for their daily bread, that in their minds they had to be thinking at some level about these stories of their past, of their ancestry, of their journeys in the wilderness, and how God provided daily bread for them. But it's not just this physical reality that God is asking us to pray for. It seems to me that he's also asking us to pray for something more. And we get a glimpse of this when we look to John chapter 6. In John 6, we read of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus was teaching and the crowd was there for a long period of time and became hungry. And the disciples came to Jesus asking for him to send the crowds away that they may go get something to eat. But instead, Jesus told his disciples that they should feed them. They had no idea how that could possibly happen. And so Jesus asked them, well, what do you have? And they responded, we have five loaves and two fish. Jesus asked them to bring it to him. He prayed over it, and then he began breaking it up and distributing it to the people. He gave and gave to them until they were full. And still after that, there were 12 baskets fulls to be collected of what was left. The people experienced this reality and they wanted to make Jesus king. So instead, he went away to be by himself. And over that night, he crossed over the Sea of Galilee by walking on water. And then we read the next day that on the other side, the crowds found him again. In John chapter 6, verses 25 through 35, we read that when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed the seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do? To do the works God requires. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? 
what will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus had miraculously fed the 5,000, and the crowds hungered for more, but they weren't hungering for the right things. All that they were hungering for was a free meal, and they came seeking that out. And when they asked for a sign to know that what Jesus was saying was true, they could have asked for him to have parted the Sea of Galilee like God parted the Red Sea. But instead, they just continued to ask for more of that physical bread to meet their physical hunger. But they'd missed the meaning of the sign. They missed the deeper reality of who Jesus is and what he actually had to offer them to offer them beyond their physical needs because he is the bread of life and he offers sustenance beyond those physical realities. We see him come back to this in verses 48 through 51. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. In all of this, Jesus is referring back to this story in the wilderness that we already reflected on from Exodus chapter 16 of how God provided for the physical needs of the people. But he's also calling them to something much deeper, to the spiritual sustenance that only he, as the bread of life, can offer. And so it seems to me that within this prayer, as we ask for God to give us our daily bread, we're at the very least asking for him to provide both our physical sustenance, bread to eat, shelter, clothing, the things of life that we need. But beyond that, also praying for God to provide that spiritual sustenance that only he can offer to us through him, the bread of life. But in all of this, it seems to me that the reality is that it's not just about the providing of those physical and spiritual needs because it's done with a deeper and greater purpose to it. And I think we see that in aspects of the echoes throughout the Sermon on the Mount on this phrase, this prayer for God to give us our daily bread. I mean, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, we read that, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. There's this promise of God that when we seek for him, he will fill us in our needs. We also read in chapter 6, verse 25 and following, that we should not worry about our life, what we will eat or drink, or about our bodies, what we will wear. For life is more than what we eat, and the body is more than what we wear. And then he goes on to remind us that God has provided for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, and how much more will he provide for us? And then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and following, we read, Ask, and you'll receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and a door will be opened for you. For those who ask, receive. Those who seek, find, and those who knock, the door will be opened unto them. We don't need to worry about these things. In fact, he goes on to say that, what, Who of you would, when their son asks for a loaf of bread, give them a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, give him a serpent? If you, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more will the Father in heaven give to you? God promises to provide. 
But within this, he's also using this as a way of revealing himself to us. He's offering to us experiential assurances of who God is in our lives. That's part of what we read in this passage from Exodus 16. Did you catch it? When the people cry out to God for food, he responds that he'll provide it. And the reason that he'll provide it is so that they will know that he is their God. He will provide so that they will know that he is their God. You see, our prayer for God to give us our daily bread is certainly about him providing our physical sustenance. And I believe it's about him providing our spiritual sustenance as well. But more than that, the process and the experience of him providing those things for us is about revealing to us who he is, that he is our God. Which brings me back to that service trip with SWAP in the summer of 2004, the youth of Grace Mennonite Church, as we went down to Eola, Kentucky to serve the people of Appalachia. We went there with the resources that God had given to us, intending to offer those to the people there. And we did. We served them. We did construction work. But there were some things that happened in the process that we hadn't expected. In the process of serving at homes with families, we developed deep and meaningful relationships with the people there. It wasn't just about the work that we were doing. It was about the relationships that we were developing and, and the hospitality that they were extending to us as strangers coming to their homes. But even more than that, there was the provision that they offered to us. You see, when we went down there, MCC provided all the food that we needed. We had breakfast before we left the job site. In fact, we even packed sacked lunches to take with us to the job site. And then in the evening, after we had showered and cleaned up, we would have dinner together back at our host site. But one of the families that we went to serve chose to offer us lunch on one of the days that we were at their house. And they didn't just bring out a simple meal. They brought out a banquet table of food, a smorgasbord of things to eat. Now, none of it was fancy or ostentatious. It was simple things like hot dogs and chili sauce and potato chips and cut up vegetables. But the generosity that they offered to us in the midst of how little that they had was a profound lesson to us of experiencing God's provision for us, of experiencing God's love for us as we worked to live out faithfully what he had called us to. It was a transformative experience for us in which we received what God had to offer and in the process revealed to us who God is. As we pray the Lord's Prayer, as we seek for God's kingdom to come and for him to give us our daily bread, we certainly are asking for God to provide the physical sustenance that he promises to us. And I believe that we are praying for his spiritual sustenance as well through Jesus, the bread of life. But all of that is for the purpose of us understanding and experiencing who God is. To know him, to love him, and to experience his love through the provision that he gives to us. In these times of uncertainty in which we may feel a certain level of anxiety or a sense of scarcity, or as we may see that in the lives of the people around us, may we take comfort in the knowledge of God's provision for us. And may we experience who God is through the receiving of what he has to offer to us. Amen. Part of worship is to bring our offerings to the Lord. This may be through our praise or thanksgiving, and sometimes it's even through our financial gifts as well. Perhaps God has spoken to you this morning and you want to respond with a gift in that sort uh, to his work through us. 
or perhaps you would choose to give as a discipline of faithfulness and trust in God amid this current uncertainty. If so, you may mail a check to the church or give through the online giving portal on our website. Today's offering will be split between Safe Place and Celebrate Recovery, as was previously scheduled. Huron County's Safe Place is a resource for survivors of domestic abuse and sexual assault. More than just a shelter, Safe Place provides residential and non-residential comprehensive services to women and children from all over Huron, Sanilac, and Tuscola counties. You can learn more by going to their website, huroncountysafeplace.com. This link, along with a video about this ministry, can be found in this week's newsletter. Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered ministry designed to provide a pathway to freedom for individuals who are struggling with various hurts, habits, and hang-ups that, that hold rather people in bondage and prevent individuals from walking in the joys that God has promised. Community Wesleyan Church of Elkton hosts a local CR group, and your contribution will go today to celebrate that local chapter. You can learn more about that by going to their website, cwcelkton.org slash recovery. Let us pray. Father, today as we come before you in this time of offering, we thank you for the many good gifts that you have given us. We appreciate so much things that we acknowledge you have given and even, Lord, the ways in which you have provided that we have never noticed. And today as we give back, we think about the portions that uh, we give to you and ask for them to go forward for your kingdom work. We thank you so much, Lord, for all the things that you have provided. And we think about that penultimate gift that is Jesus and his great concern and care for us in teaching us so many different things. And indeed, Lord, one of the things that he has taught us is how to pray. So we together here now pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue our worship with this offertory performance by the Walking Roots Band, shared with their permission. Rest assured he's not forgotten Rest assured he'll take care of you Look at the times he's been there before He'll be there again, rest assured Here it comes, that empty feeling it's got you believing, you're all alone. There's something telling you that you won't make it. You just can't shake it, and you feel you can't go on. Rest assured, he's not forgotten. Rest assured, he'll take care of you. Look at the times he's been there before. He'll be there again, rest assured. You've been praying and believing, but you're not receiving. Seems hope is gone. You're feeling like you just can't go on anymore. But that's what faith is for, so keep on holding on. Rest assured, he's not forgotten. Rest assured, he'll take care of you. Look at the times he's been there before. He'll be there again, 
rest assured. He'll be there again, rest assured. He'll be there again, rest assured. and griefs to bear what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer oh what peace we often forfeit oh what needless pain we bear oh because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. In lieu of our typical sharing time, we invite you to email your requests to Emily. and She will compile a list and send it out later. After the service, we encourage you to take a moment to watch the latest update from Marie Mosk, our church nurse. This can be found on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel. At 11 a.m., the children are invited to participate in the Sunday School lesson online through Zoom. Contact Sherry Craig if you need that access information. Also at 11 a.m., the youth are invited to participate in a Zoom Sunday School lesson as well. Contact me, Pastor Bill, if you need the access information for that session. Adults, you are encouraged to study through that subscription that we have to Right Now Media. If you're not sure where to begin, we encourage you to watch Overcoming Anxiety During COVID-19. At 3 p.m. today, and every day, we continue our online prayer gathering on our church Facebook page. And also, on Tuesday evening, we will have our next church-wide check-in on Zoom. Details about that can be found in the newsletter. Receive now this benediction. It comes from Numbers. It's the priestly blessing, which Moses gives to Aaron and the Levites, and now I give it to you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace. You are dismissed. Go in peace. <laughs>